further ado, I would like to welcome you all to the BLSI Philosophy uh, Group Meeting and Series. And I am delighted to have uh, the BLSI's own philosophy convener, Don, Dr. Don Cameron, here to give a lecture on a very fundamental topic in philosophy, and that is determinism and free will. I mean, Don's background is, is his doctor, Don Cameron. Uh, he's also the owner of the largest manufacturer of hot air balloons. He's been at the BLSI for well over a decade. He's overseen hundreds, literally hundreds of lectures, and he has given dozens of lectures himself. And he's also written several books on philosophy, including The Meaning of Life. Now, today, it is all about determinism and free will. And I just wonder we, whether we will find out whether we have always been destined since the beginning of time to all be here at this point on this Zoom meeting on uh, July the 7th at 7.39, or whether it was our own volition and free will that drove us to listen to Don today. It is with great pleasure that I now hand you over to Don Cameron. Don. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm daring this evening to talk about a favorite subject of philosophers, determinism and free will. This is a subject where we really do not need to follow the bad habit of many in philosophy, where we discuss the question but reach no solution. I believe this question has a solution, although it needs a little bit of effort to understand an apparent paradox. If you're not yet familiar with it, I hope you'll find your evening has been usefully spent. Of course, there's no such thing as total certainty. We cannot even be sure that the rules of logic that evolution has installed in our brains, but the, the solution which we have is correct for all practical purposes, and we can show that it is as certain as we're going to get. The question before us seems to be that the physical world behaves according to scientific laws. Everything that happens depends on the preceding conditions. If that were not true, there would be no grounds for any knowledge. We would not be able to predict anything and science would be impossible. The, the appearance of a deterministic world would be just as true if we don't know all the laws and we do not have a precise knowledge of the, of the present state of things. Even a brain, which is a, an information processing device, made of nerve cells, will behave according to these physical and chemical laws. It will be deterministic. Given the same starting state and incoming information, it would always arrive at the same conclusion. Now, this might be an admirable characteristic for a judge in a law court, but some feel offended by it applying to normal life. They feel that they make the choices freely, not as a purely mechanical result of pre-existing conditions. They claim to have free will, yet if matter behaves as it seems to do, following predictable laws, then that cannot be true. Laplace was a distinguished French scientist who published Mécanique Céleste, which showed that the motions of the planets follow Newton's laws very exactly. Isolated masses moving in a vacuum are tractable to mathematics, and he showed that it's possible to calculate astronomical events far into the future. When the emperor asked him where God came into his calculations, he famously replied, je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse. I have no need of that hypothesis. Laplace proposed a demon, which if it could know the position of every particle in the universe and every natural law defining their behavior, it would, be, it would be possible to have a, a vast calculating power to work out the future states. He claimed, for such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. Of course, such a demon is impossible. The measurement of every particle in the universe could not be made without affecting these particles, and the computation would be, to say the least, rather difficult. Would the demon be able to calculate its own future calculations? And in a world in which a butterfly flapping its wings could perhaps change major weather events, 
a system which really is completely deterministic can still be so hard to analyze that it looks very random. But we do not need to believe in such a demon. It's possible that the world is far too complex for our small brains, but every particle of it may still be behaving according to fixed laws. We can reach for quantum mechanics, but this is no help in the problem of free will. If most of our mental processes are deterministic, but a few are a little bit random, that doesn't seem a very useful freedom of choice. Also, since quantum mechanics is concerned with things on a very small scale, and consequently in very large numbers, the statistical law of large numbers will apply. Outcomes on the macro scale will be deterministic for all practical purposes. The solution, I think, is clear. If our brains are deterministic mechanisms, albeit of immense complexity, and if we are making our choices free of any other person's compulsion, how could we ever feel that we were not making a free choice? So does that mean that determinism is right? I think it probably does. Determinism might be incompatible with free will in some sense, but it is not incompatible with the subjective feeling of having free will. And does that mean that the future of the entire universe is predetermined by the present state of things? Probably it does. Certainly what will be will be. There is one unique set of events in the future out of the many that are conceivable. And I'm not persuaded by the idea of multiple universes. Maybe there is a little bit of randomness happening among all the particles that are following fixed laws. But that makes little difference. When the future becomes now, there will be a single outcome and any random processes will have yielded the result. A lottery result is no longer an unknown after winning, after the winning ticket has been drawn. But we really have no means of knowing whether there's some, there really are some truly random processes occurring among the great number of those which seem to follow natural laws. The world is certainly substantially deterministic but that is, that is the only reason that knowledge and science are possible. But some random processes may still be conceivable. If these exist, what we are talking about here is fundamental randomness. Matter behaving in a way that is fundamentally unpredictable in the manner described in quantum mechanics. This is quite distinct from our normal use of the word random, which refers mainly to our own incomplete knowledge of a deterministic system. When a collection of numbered balls are mixed in a machine until one drops out at random, there's no need to consider that the movement of the balls might not be deterministic. Yet it remains a fair lottery because the complexity of the movement is too great for anyone to control or forecast. Weather forecasting is an interesting example. When computer modeling came in, the experienced old manual forecasters tried to beat it, but they failed. Yet, even so, its imprecise knowledge of the starting conditions and its less than perfect cal calculations meant that it diverged from reality over a couple of days. But no one doubted that weather, although complex, was deterministic. By improving the data input, reducing the grid size, in using massive computing power, we can now forecast up to a week ahead. Now, so far, I have not raised any difficult concept. Things are almost certainly deterministic, but as long as we can suppress our wishful thinking, there is no great difficulty in understanding that. But now we come to a more difficult point. Does it all mean that there's no use trying to change what happens? In a deterministic world, are all human ambitions and efforts to bring about good outcomes completely pointless? The answer is not necessarily, because our efforts to bring about good outcomes are part of the deterministic process that happens. This creates a problem which is difficult to grasp. It's a difficult paradox, but we must understand it if we are to understand the whole question. We can get a clearer view if we stand back and look at humanity from the outside. It's not contrary to determinism to imagine a population 
that his evolved deterministic brains that generate desires and goals. The deterministic action of these brains include striving to make things happen while not necessarily knowing what the outcome will be. These instincts to try to affect the future could have evolved in a perfectly deterministic way because those who happen to make the best effort often had the more favorable results. When we face a really important task, we might tell ourselves that we must make an effort, perhaps foregoing something more entertaining. There's no reason to suppose that this mental process is not predetermined. And we might notice that when we have tried hard, that we get a better outcome. And that may lead us to try harder in the future. Once again, there is nothing in that which could not be deterministic. When we're engaged in a competitive game, before the outcome is known, we may feel that the final score is all to play for. The victory will go to the side that has the greatest motivation and skill, but nothing compels us to doubt that these qualities are the deterministic results of preceding states. The path taken by the ball depends on very simple deterministic laws, although the player's minds may be immensely complicated but still operating according to fixed natural laws. The meaning of this is that determin determinism should not deflect us from the idea that ambition and effort are worthwhile. Clearly they are, despite being the result of matter behaving according to fixed laws. If a person decided after listening to a philosophy talk that it was no use trying anymore because things are deterministic, he would have a brain going through a deterministic process to reach a, a wrong conclusion. Brains do sometimes reach long, wrong conclusions, but there's no reason to suppose that this is not a deterministic process. It has been said that a deterministic view of the world should excuse all crime. If from long before he was born, a murderer was predestined to commit the crime, how, he, how can he reasonably be blamed? This too is difficult to understand and is once again best understood by looking at humanity from the outside. Human societies have evolved systems of justice, blame and many other mechanisms to discourage undesirable behavior. They evolved quite deterministically because they were successful. These systems of justice are part of the prior conditions that lead to the deterministic outcome. They exist because they, quite deterministically, deter crime. It reinforces the view that punishment serves as a deterrent to crime, not for revenge. But we must aware, be aware that our instinct for revenge e evolved for exactly the same reason. It's important to understand this paradox. Yes, the world is substantially, probably totally deterministic, but no, this does not mean that we should stop trying to make it better. We have here the answer to the old problem of free will, or at least as much of the answer as we're ever likely to get. We can't be absolutely sure that the events of the world, including our mental processes, are determined by laws acting in preceding states of matter, but it seems probable beyond a reasonable doubt, and none of the arguments which philosophers have produced have given a valid reason to doubt it. I'm reminded of the old limerick. There was a young man who said, damn, I perceive with regret that I am an engine that moves in predestinate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. Determinism is correct, but we are still correct to strive to make things better in the future to be careful to avoid accidents and to punish crimes. The concept is, I think, undeniable, but hard to understand. Looking from the outside, determinism is not inconsistent with the properties of the universe and all our mental processes. But when viewed from the first person position, it gives food for thought. Now, some people might say that they have something called a soul and the consciousness is not due to the functioning of the 86 billion nerve cells and 860 billion glial cells that form the human brain. But the evidence of science has, in my view, completely discredited that. 
consciousness is a problem that philosophers continue to argue about. It's never perfectly defined, but we all know what we're talking about. We experience a sensation of being ourselves and having mental existence. It disappears during sleep, but reappears when we wake, and perhaps a little bit in dreaming. In former times, it was recognized that people and animals were different from stones and chairs. They were imbued with a special property, a life force or spirit. Everything was either inert or had this special property of being able to move autonomously. Of course, there were no internal combustion engines or electric motors in those days. It was the life spirit, or in humans the soul, which kept the body alive, and death happened when the soul departed. It's now much more plausible to believe that the body is a complex mechanism with an information processing organ of great complexity. Death occurs when it ceases to work, not through something leaving it. In particular, it seems feasible that our brains, with their billions of neurons sending impulses to each other, are the devices responsible for all our thoughts. Our lives seem precarious. If blood flow to the brain stops for just a few minutes, it's irreparably damaged. It depends on a muscular pump which starts beating before we're born and keeps going for maybe up to a century. Neuroscience is not complete, but a great deal is known. Much is known about the structure of nerve cells and the details of their electrochemical impulses. Billions of these impulses are happening all the time and different mental experiences correspond to greater activity in different parts of the brain. If brain activity ceases, there is no conscious behavior from its possessor. The obvious conclusion is that all human behavior and consciousness is the functioning of these 86 billion neurons, all sending strings of impulses to others. When I observe one of my acquaintances, it seems that this act of memory, expression of wishes, inferences from observations and all other aspects of behavior could be explained as the functioning of the brain. We also know that brain injury or disease can drastically alter behavior. Degenerative disease can cause a loss of various functions, such as short-term memory, face recognition, and other abilities that we take for granted. Often, corresponding changes can be seen in the structure of the brain. Our mental behavior and experience can be changed by alcohol and drugs. And for some of these, it's known how the drug interferes with neurotransmitter chemicals in the brain. So we might assume that there is no real problem. Although neuroscientists have much work left to do to understand the process in detail, we can be fairly sure that our consciousness is a product of this biological computer. But not everyone agrees. While it is so straightforward to see our friend's behavior as the result of all this information processing, going on in their brains, it is much more difficult to conclude this about my own first person experience. I know what it's like to be me. I feel that I am there looking out of my eyes. My hopes, fears and emotions really matter, at least to me, and it's difficult to believe that I'm no more than an information processing device working by sending impulses along fibers from one nerve cell to another. There's something more to this experience of self. I'm not only thinking and making decisions, but I know that I'm thinking. That in itself would not preclude the physical explanation of consciousness. It's perfectly possible that parts of the brain are receiving information about the activities in other parts. But there's still the subjective feeling that consciousness is me, a little person sitting at the controls and receiving all this information from the brain. Of course, whatever the subjective feeling, this must be wrong. There is no homunculus or little person inside the head. The identity of self of any human comes from the whole of the nervous system and is distributed within it. Of course, the religious hypothesis remains. The mind is a function of the soul, which is an indestructible immaterial thing which inhabits the body. It's installed by God at birth and departs at death. The main thing wrong with this idea is that there's no scrap of decent evidence to support it. 
And what would all these billions of neurons with the trillions of nerve impulse, impulses be for? But is consciousness really such a hard problem? It involves a number of attributes, many of which can easily be understood as the functioning of the nervous system. Let's consider removing one by one these elements, which we can agree could simply be neurons at work. What kind of consciousness would there be if vision, hearing, touch and all sources of input information were removed? Then imagine that all long-term and short-term memory is removed. Then imagine that the objective of self-preservation is removed. Then suppose that our deductive logical abilities are removed. All of these could plausibly be functions of a new network of neurons, but what kind of consciousness could be left? I think the available evidence points to the conclusion that there is no disembodied entity which could fun function independently of the material world. Some may cling to the idea of a soul, but even if they are correct, it's difficult to see how it would deny determinism. So my conclusion in summary is, yes, the world is deterministic. What happens is almost certainly totally specified by what has gone before. This is true even if we do not know everything about the prior conditions and we do not know all of the laws. Of course, we're not certain that there could still be some truly random elements among all the deterministic uh, uh, processes. But no, we should not give up trying to change the future because these efforts are part of the deterministic process that creates the future. For the same reason, we are right to punish criminals because it really does deter crime, although that remains a deterministic process. So I'll be interested to hear your questions and discussions. Don, that was great and a huge amount of food for thought. That's excellent. Maybe for those of you who want to unmute yourself and show the video, please, uh, please do that now. And then we can thank uh, uh, Don in the usual way by giving him a good clap for a excellent rendition of free determinism and free will. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion this, this evening to see whether we are all determined human machines or whether we feel to be in control of our own uh, future. It would be a very interesting discussion. So what I suggest we do is I'll just pick somebody out who raises their hand. It's probably in the old fashioned way. It's probably the best way forward. But before we do, can we give Don just a, a show of our appreciation by uh, giving him a, a good rendition? <laughs> That's great. So we've got a few of us who are unmuting and uh, and uh, starting the video. Who wants to go first? Who's got a question? Well, can you hear me? Uh, I can. Yeah. We'll come to you second, Chrissy. I think Daisy, okay. Daisy yeah. had a... I've up. always got something to say, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. She can go first. I don't mind. <laughs> Daisy. Daisy, you go first. Oh, okay. Well, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that was an absolutely wonderful and very fascinating lecture. And uh, second, I was wondering, do you personally think that determinism and free will are mutually exclusive? Or would you consider yourself more of a compatibilist like Hobbes and Hume, who thinks that free will can still exist in its entirety in a deterministic world? Well, I think the, the, the feeling of free will and the full effect of free will is there, um, but it's simply that uh, what we will is uh, is a function of the of our brain processes, which are may, probably natural laws acting on on matter. So we certainly have the feeling of free will, and um, I don't know how you would ever ever not feel you had free will, but. Um, it's still a deterministic process in all probability. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, good first can, question. We're going to Chrissy next. Chrissy. Yes, when I was in university about 10 years ago, this was a subject that kept coming up. Now, I have been doing something extraordinary since 1971, which is consulting the I Ching Oracle, and it constantly appalls me by being accurate. It always comes up with someone accurate. 
and because everyone was discussing determinism and free will I sorry I, did, I didn't quite catch what you said you were, you were consulting what the I Ching oracle it's an ancient Chinese oh, yeah. oracle right so you, yes. um, and I've been talking to it since 1971 <laughs> and it's always very intelligent now I don't bother it usually with questions um, unless I feel that it's fair but because everybody in university was discussing this subject I thought it was fair to ask it what it's response was and I threw the hexagram work on what has been spoiled which you can't do if you haven't got some free will yes and there were two lines and the one line said setting right what has been spoiled by the father uh, if there is a son no blame rests upon the departed father and um, in the end will be good fortune but tolerating it says what has been spoiled by the father in continuing one sees humiliation now that seems to suggest to me that the father is what you're talking about, which is the, the, the thing we're, you know, we're born with, all this scientific um, personality we've got and our bodies, we can't change the shape of our bodies and all that sort of stuff. But it does seem to suggest that we can do something about it and it's humiliating if we don't. Yes? So if we've got a very, very bad temper, it's not our fault we've been born with a bad tempered personality, but we can say, God, we've got a bad tempered personality, I'll try not to be so bad tempered. That's what the eating is saying. Okay. So, so I thought, what do you think of that? <laughs> okay, so Chris is taking a compatibilist approach as well, Don, you know? Yeah. How would you respond? I, I don't think we're inconsistent with that, but the, the and, and, and indeed, um, you, the question of course is, can we blame criminals if it's been determined from before they were born? But um, the, it's nevertheless true that all the processes, including our determination to change the future, could be deterministic events. Yeah. So, um, and, it, and it's a good thing that we, that we, that we produce these uh, efforts to, to improve the future, yeah. but um, they could still be deterministic. Yes, well, that's what the eating is suggesting. By the father is the deterministic part that we're born with, the shape of our body, our height, our personality, whether we're an angry sort of person or a, a generous sort of person. That's, that's what we're born with, and we can't change that. But what it's suggesting is that if there's something not very nice about it, then it is humiliating not to try and put that right. Okay. That's all. I'm just telling you what the eating is. We're probably born with the with the mentality that we'll try to put it right. Good. Oh well, that's marvelous. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I hope we've all got that mentality. Good. Yes. Yeah. All right. Oh, I, one other quick thing is I did have a near death experience once. Yes, and uh, um, I got sent back. I wasn't pleased, and just before I opened my eyes, the voice a voice said it was only for a second. So that was way back about 25, 30 years ago, and that second hasn't gone yet. Yes, it, <laughs> there's a, quite an interesting article in a recent edition of the Scientific American mm. on near-death experiences. Mm. And um, uh, the, the, the author of that is saying that, uh, who's trying to do some research on it, asking a lot of people, mm. uh, has said that, uh, in fact, they all report that it's extremely vivid. Um, mm. And, and, and remains with them for a long time. Yeah. But um, again, he doesn't doubt that they're caused by uh, stress on the, on, on the brain, which produces these effects. Maybe. Rather, rather than the supernatural. Maybe, yes. I mean, you, you found Christy, a little... Christy, we need to give somebody else a go as well. Yeah, we will. I'm just thinking yes, of... We're, um, we're getting off the subject, aren't we? Yes, we, yes. Do, we are a little All bit. is but a woven web of guesses. Who said yes. that? Was it Xenophane? Yes, absolutely. I think it Xenophane. So i leave it to you now. It's all is but a woven web of guesses. That's very I kind of you. I just wanted to put him on a lot. Thank I you very much. Oh, well, that's fine. Thank you very much. Who wants to ask the next question? I see quite a few people are on mute. Nobody has got any other questions on determinism and free will. I'm looking at the, the usual suspects here, Mike and Colin, for example, but they're remaining extremely silent on the matter. <laughs> no? So I have a question in the meantime for, for everybody else to formulate their own. 
we need to be clear about the definition of determinism. I mean, does determinism mean that it has been determined since the beginning of time, for example, that we are going to be assembled at this particular Zoom meeting on the 7th of July at uh, 20.08 now to listen to you, uh, your lecture and uh, the Q&A session? Well, if, if determinism is total and and there is nothing, uh, no random processes. And, and again, I'm talking about the truly random, not the, the, the balls in the machine, which are perfectly deterministic. Um, but if, if it is totally deterministic, in other words, if, if, the, if a given state of, of matter and electromagnetic radiation and everything else implies by, by fixed laws what the succeeding state will be, <clears throat> then, um, then yes, it would. Everything would be determined from the beginning of time, and uh, this Zoom meeting and and the fact that coronavirus is making us have it, and it, all that would be determined. Um, so uh, it's not an appealing thing in some ways, but on the other hand, it's not too terrible either. Well, I suppose. We are, we are therefore not in control of our lives, but as you pointed out, we, that doesn't mean we should go scot-free. You know, there's still an apportionment of blame if we are contravening the laws of the land, for example. You know, we are still being uh, taken to account. Although uh, it, we ourselves on a subjective level may argue that actually it's been determined that I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be doing that. The fact is well, that it, and this is a terrible paradox that um, it's it's not a worthwhile way of thinking because we we should try to improve the future yeah um, and um, when we do try hard a better outcome comes but it was predetermined that we were going to try hard yeah or, not, or, to, or not try well at all I mean we could or, or it may well be that it was predetermined that we weren't going to take the trouble and we we're going to have a less good outcome. But, but it's still true that trying hard makes for a better outcome. Yeah, of course. But uh, that, you're still in the lap of the determinism, determinism in terms of whether you were destined, not, de not destined, determined to try better or not. Yes, you might be destined to not really make any effort and and to have terrible outcomes. Anyway, I think, I've, I think we've got them going now. I think they, 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 the hands are going up. So yep. it's good. Maybe you want to ask a question. So is, is Sully Clee is the... I'm sorry, it's Stuart. Yes. <laughs> it's just my wife's laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm desperately trying to remember the, the plot of a film with Gwyneth Paltrow in it called Sliding Doors. But I think the theme of it was um, um, a, a random chance of meeting or not meeting someone changed her entire life. Yeah. If we're thinking of determinism that people's behaviour is predetermined, it doesn't really allow for how people interact with other people and can change from those interactions. And those meetings are somewhat happenstance. Well... <clears throat> there's certainly happenstance events. Um, we, we, you happen to meet the person that uh, you might get married to, and by pure chance that you happen to be in the same place at the same time. But that chance, all the movements of every molecule in that whole scene are still moving according to natural laws. So the fact that it was chance to, to, to your mind does not mean that it was not predetermined. I mean, I'm not talking about anything spooky here. It's just that um, that all events could still be predetermined. That, that, that wouldn't negate it. And <clears throat> I'm not saying it's determined by someone. Um, you know, sometimes uh, on the question of meeting someone, you say we were meant to meet each other. Not, nobody meant it, but it was still uh, a predetermined thing that happened from a previous condition of, of the world. I don't know if that's clear. It's a, it's a terribly hard thing to, to get your mind around. 
the, the idea that um, these things can all seem all to play for and yet be predetermined. Yeah, but Stuart is murmuring, I think. <laughs> I'm not getting a sense that he's overly convinced. Do you want to follow up on that, Stuart? Yeah, it, it, how can I describe it? It's almost as if we're breaking people down into, into atoms and molecules that are going to be uh, arrive at a certain point in a certain time. Well, I think we are certainly made up of atoms and molecules. I, I, do, I, I, I think we are more than that, hopefully. Um, well, we're a particularly non-random assembly of atoms and molecules, but we're still we're still atoms and molecules. Of course, we are. Stephen Hawking says we're part of a virtual reality as well. So there's the program going on, and I have a, a model of that programming, so I know he's right. Okay, there's a program. I shall introduce it to you another time. Okay, mm. thank you, Chrissy. <laughs> Mike, take into account how, how one person's can influence another. Well, that's, that's right. And these events, it, of course, one person can influence another. And, um, but nevertheless, the fact that that person was going to influence the other was predetermined by a preceding state. So that's not an argument against determinism. No. Mm. I, think it's it's I always go backwards with that argument. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's an infinite regress. Yes. yes, it is. Yes, and I'm, I'm defeated. I shall go on mute. <laughs> we got We're, defeated. It's, uh, We're only here for fun, aren't we? Yeah, Mike, over to you. You raised your hand. Yeah, thanks. I think the problem with determinism oh. is that it is indeterminate. We can <laughs> never be sure where. Oh no, you're breaking up a bit, Mike. Totally insoluble problem. Um, and therein lies the paradox. However, the evidence would seem to suggest that probably um, things are determinate and things are determined. But we are then caught in another paradox that we have no option but to behave as though that were not true because there is no other way out of it yes, except you know, some sort of total mental breakdown. So I, I, agree, I, I think absolutely. I put you that that is the way we have to behave, even if it makes no, even it has no effect. You have stated it pretty well, but um, we have this um, feeling that we can that we can change the future, and indeed we do change the future, but our actions in changing it could still be part of a determin deterministic process. But the, as you say, there's no way of proving that this is absolute. If it's just mainly deterministic, then it means it will, it will run on, but we'll have random things happening. But we, we need to think carefully, what do we mean by random? Because mm. the balls going round in the machine for the, for the lottery, uh, and, and one of them falls out, that is completely deterministic, balls bouncing off each other. And yet, it's random as far as we're concerned. But is there something that, are there any things that are really fundamentally random in, in some greater sense than the balls going around in the lottery machine? I mean, that's the problem, isn't it, Don? The, the, the answer, the honest answer to that will be, it seems not. Um, it seems not. It, it, no. it seems not. That's why I say that it's probably deterministic. But there's a, a little area of doubt there. Yeah. Can I point out just a little point here, and that is that we uh, maybe we've got, um, you know, the deterministic thing is happening to us, but we can either laugh at it or get upset. And I make a choice when things happen to laugh. I don't take, you know, even though uh, naturally my personality might get upset, and it does get upset, I let it get upset, but I also look at it from outside because I have had a near death experience. So I look at it from outside and, and, and I laugh at it and it's allowed to be upset. I think looking from outside is often the best way of thinking about things. Yeah. Good. Who wants to go next? Okay, we've got uh, Jeremy wants to ask a question and then we get to Phil after that. Yeah, well, I got two questions. Um, 
would you say that uh, there's elements of our existence that are indeterministic as well as deterministic? And how does determinism sit with probability? The, the probability that an event may or may not occur. Um, it could be determined that if it does occur, but if it doesn't occur, then you could argue it's not deterministic. Well, if, if I'm arguing that very probably the whole thing is deterministic, yeah. um, but we have a situation where if, if somebody tells you that um, there, there, there is, a, is a, a red ball, a yellow ball, and, the, and a blue ball inside a bag, and yeah. you have to put your hand in and pull out a ball, and they're, they're, they're like snooker balls, they, they all feel the same, yeah. uh, then you have a one-third probability that you'll pull out a red ball. Yeah, but um, that's that's an expression of your ignorance of the, right. the deterministic system. It's okay. still totally deterministic. Yeah, I accept that it's totally deterministic. But in terms of outcome, it, you could argue if it doesn't, if if it doesn't, if that one third doesn't <laughs> um, apply, if I can put it like that, um, then you could argue it's become indeterminate. Well, I mean, the probability is. is and determinism it's between being indeterminism and determinism and what i'm suggesting is it may be that there's elements of indeterminism within a predominantly deterministic universe. this is what i was saying we have all these things where we we yeah. think it's uh, at random when yeah, we sure. it draw a, of, but randomness might be part of the indeterminism we draw a, a, a raffle ticket out of the hat allegedly yeah. at random but yeah. it's not a random process it's just that yeah. We yeah. don't know what it will be, so therefore it's a fair raffle okay. because we don't know, but it's still perfectly deterministic. You put your hand in there and you felt a certain yeah. ticket and you pulled you it out. You can see there's an element of indeterminism there in the randomness. In no, that's not, that's not true randomness in the sense mm -hmm. that I'm searching for. The, the balls going round in the, in the tombola, no, are, no. they're bouncing off each other in a perfectly deterministic way. It's okay. just that we haven't got enough knowledge to analyze uh, exactly which ball will come out. Knowledge, isn't it? If we have the knowledge. But there might be some things which really are truly random. But right. certainly most of the things we talk about are, are as random, are quite deterministic, but it's just our lack of knowledge. Yeah. Deterministic, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you for that. Phil, you were next to ask a question. Uh, yes, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Don. That was very interesting and, and it fitted very well with my own very amateurish sort of philosophical thoughts I, I, I have. Um, and it makes me feel very, very comfortable, except my, I don't know if it's a question or just a statement. I, whenever I go through these sorts of thoughts, I end up with the, the idea of, so what? I mean, it doesn't actually affect anything. I shall just carry on knowing or feeling that it's all deterministic. So it doesn't actually get me anywhere. So my, my final thought is, yes, I think it's all like that, but so what? And uh, so it's not really a question. Well, unless you, unless you can answer the question, so what? Yes, it probably is predetermined that, uh, that you will be careful that uh, you don't step in front of a bus, for example. And it's worth making the effort not to do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, so what? I don't think it has any practical advice for, for uh, how you should live your life, other than that you should carry on doing what you're doing now. Yes, yes, that's okay. Thank you. That's my, con that's my conclusion, yes. Okay. Any more questions from everybody? Anybody? No, it doesn't know. Well, I've got one, and I think Jeremy's got another one. So, Jeremy, I'll pass over to you first. Yes, it's to do with the free will aspect. Um, can, can we still have free will to do something in spite of the world being determined? There's a sense in which we're free. I'm thinking of Sartre and existentialism. <coughs> we certainly feel that we're free. Relevant or not, but I, I feel we can still be free in spite of the fact that everything's deterministic. Yes. Well, we, we feel that we're free, of course. Yeah, we feel our, we are, don't we? our brains are, are, yeah. have all these little uh, electrons and chemicals yeah. migrating in and out of our nerve fibers to send yeah. the impulses along. Yeah. And all these things are happening as a perfectly physical process. And yet yeah. it adds up to us feeling that we have free will. Yeah. And um, of course, if we're taking decisions using our own brains and uh, free of any other person's interference 
mm. then of course we feel that we're taking a free decision. Mm. Mm. We're taking responsibility and we're acting, we feel we're acting freely. Mm. Yeah. But wow. we're, we're still <clears throat> starting from a starting condition, um, yeah. given the same information inputs, we will probably reach the same output. Yeah. And as I said earlier, that's a, that's what a, a judge in a law court should absolutely do. Yeah, um, sure. But uh, personally, it, it doesn't feel right, but it looks as if it is right. Um, I feel that I can't change life, but what I can do is change my attitude to what's happening. That is my free will. <laughs> and that's what I think the eating means in work and what has been sport, where it says if you tolerate what's going wrong, it's humiliating. So that's what I, I make those choices myself, right? Mm. Definitely. I can't change life. I can't change what people say or whether I get on people's nerves or not or anything like that. Mm. But I can decide how to accept it. You yes. can change a lot of things, but the changes you make are probably a deterministic process. Yes. So mm. it, was, it was predetermined, Chrissy, that you were changing your attitude. Yes, absolutely, darling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Must be predetermined, obviously. Over to the racer hand. Yeah, over to Mike, and then we go to Patricia. I, I think that a word that's come up a lot in this conversation recently is the word I or me. And I think therein lies a problem. <laughs> what is I? What is me? You know, is it this narrative I produce, or is it really something else that is actually making the decisions? And I think, you know, therein lies one of the problems of free will. You do what you want to. But what, why do you want to? You know, that, that, is, the, that is the problem. It, it's, it's, it's going back, those levels. There is this me, I think, is me on the surface. But there are other me's, as it's once been described, people are, people's personalities are like sort of onions, mm -hmm. layer after layer after layer. What is the me that lies behind it that's really driving it, really making a decision? The brain is. Uh, I can explain, but Chrissy, first let, let, of all, sorry, Don, it's your turn. Not Chrissy, let Don do, explain first, and then we come back to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The brain is, of course, uh, enormously complex, and um, it, it makes it very difficult to understand oneself. But if you if you decide what you want, your brain arrives at a decision of what you want, and you and you and you nobody interferes with you, and you you go ahead and do that. You feel that you're free. But um, it could still be true that the, the process that decides what you want is a deterministic one. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, before we get to Chrissy, let's go, let's go to Patricia. She's been very patient. So, Patricia, you've got a question? I'm just trying to find the start. Yes, I'm just interested in this. It's very, very interesting. But I'm thinking spiritualists, they can put you in contact with people who have gone, who can then tell you if you need help and advice. I wonder how that fits into the, what we're talking about now. Well, um, I'm and I've had, I personally, if I've, I've had that experience when I was in, had a bad time and I was seeking help and somebody told me something and I wasn't even aware when it happened. And then I, years later, I thought, my God, that's what that person told me and it's come to be. So how does that all fit in? Well, I'm afraid, uh, I, I don't wish to be impolite, but I have to say that I regard spiritualists as total frauds <laughs> who have, have developed uh, uh, very good techniques for making their, um, making their pronouncements sound plausible. But uh, even the fact that they apply the fraudulent trade uh, is a predetermined procedure. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? I, so, mean, sorry, I, I, would, I would have I would have taken that view until it actually happened to me because someone said, go along this way. Um, so I think that's, I might say, I think that's very, very judgmental to put spiritualists in that category. And it's not a means I would normally go down but I think one has to have respect 
the something beyond. Right. Um, I'm... Well, uh, everyone must have their opinion on this, and I must be honest about mine. I regard well, them as frauds. The new scientists... But they're very skillful frauds, I'll give them that. Okay. Well, the, the, the new scientist published a letter. I where Christy, I. Yeah, Christy, sorry. There's some people who haven't had a go yet. Sorry, sorry, yes, you keep me in order, darling. If you don't mind, I shall go. No, to, I don't mind. I shall go to. Uh, and unfortunately, I only know you as iPad. So. Right. Uh, <laughs> iPad. That'll do for me. That it, that's my actual name. Uh, I'm just wondering. Actually, actually, we're taking two, maybe old-fashioned and simple view of physics and the universe, because people for a long time since Newton have thought, well, basically the universe is sort of wound up and then just, just runs. Um, and actually, quite possibly, it isn't like that, that there are actually um, events that are even theoretically unpredictable. I'm, I'm thinking of things like the decaying of atoms. I mean, they, they sit there, you know, a bit of carbon-14 and then suddenly throws off some particles and becomes a bit of carbon-12. And one view is, well, of course, somewhere inside the atom, there's is these little cogwheels going around that determine when it's going to turn from carbon-14 to carbon-12. And maybe we're taking far too simplistic a view in thinking that that's how the universe is. And actually, the universe is vastly more complicated. And even um, th things like... Um, fractals where you think if you measure something more accurately you get more and more um, better prediction of the future but actually some things that are, there are minute differences that will cause it radically to, you know, it's the butterfly's wing isn't it? it will cause it to go one way or the other and it doesn't matter how precise you get even theoretically that you'll never i mean going back to i think it was um poincare with the three body problem that actually the three body problem which is three um masses moving in space and you could never ever predict how those three bodies are going to move all they're doing is attracting each other because you could never ever um, have a precise enough measure yeah. of where they were well, i think that's a, a very good question you, you raise a number of points there the the <clears throat> the, the fact that uh, atoms appear to um, change uh, in a totally unpredictable way, again, this may be an example of, a, of a, a situation where there is this fundamental randomness. But um, it may be, as you say, there's something going on inside the atom, which if we understood it, we could uh, predict it. Um, but... Um, it's hard, to, it's really impossible to know for sure which is the case. Um, whether it's the randomness is simply an expression of our ignorance or whether it is in some fundamental sense random. But whatever it is, um, a, an atom that is about to, uh, to, to undergo a change like this is one of, uh, of millions in, in, a, in a sample of material and um, as we know that radioactive substances have a quite predictable half-life because they're, um, these random events are all uh, giving a predictable answer under the law of large numbers. So the answer is yes, that's a good question. There may be the, this fundamental randomness that um, can't be predicted or it may just be that it's an expression of our ignorance that we can't predict it. Okay, anybody else for anything else? Well, I would like to uh, respond to, I think it was Mike talking about I and me. Yeah. Yes, okay. Well, I've spent the last week working on a presentation uh, called, uh, can you see it? Oppositions on the Animal Monday? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And there's, uh, on the Animal Monday, there you are, I opposes me and ex it explains it. Ah. Because the I is what we call our thoughts. I think, yes? Right? I think. But the me is what we call our physical body. Don't hurt me. Don't touch me. Don't yeah. stare at me. Do you see what I mean? So there's the me down there, which is the feelings. And there's the I up there, which is the thought. 
and in the middle is consciousness, you see. Very good. Well, maybe and Chrissy is in the middle. I am. Chrissy, maybe we need you to come and uh, give a talk at the BLSI yeah. to actually yeah. explain <laughs> your system to Can us. you see the am in the middle? Yes. I am me. So consciousness is because we have two centers of awareness, an I and a me. That's very good. Thank you, Chrissy. I've got it all sorted. It's all right. I knew you would, Chrissy. Yeah, it's, it's, I've been spending good. a long time working on this one. Very good. Very good. <laughs> uh, Don, I've got, I've got a Sorry, question. Sorry, everybody. I apologize. That's okay. Uh, Don, I've got another question for you. If uh, everything is determined by a preceding event, does that not mean for determinism that it's an infinite regress? There's no starting point to a, an uncaused first cause. Or, well, is it, or, or, or even if I think all, we can, all we can say about that, uh, I mean, one can talk about big bangs and things, but all we can really say for sure is that we don't know. And uh, we can't run from that to, uh, to adopt our, our favorite... Uh, our favorite solution but no, um, no, what no. it does mean is that every event is um, is caused by its preceding events yes um, yeah and uh, well it's not a, a regress but it could be an infinite progression well it depends which way you look backwards or forwards I suppose as time progresses uh, each event succeeds its preceding event on a determined basis. If it is deterministic, yeah. we still have this possibility of the truly random yeah. as, as against the random because we, we don't know enough. I think we're just about to get to the truly random with iPad. Yeah. You wanted to ask another question. Uh, yes, I, I think it, uh, I have to say, I don't think it actually matters. I mean, all you... If you have this deterministic, um, I'd have to say, um, clockwork universe, it doesn't matter. There's no argument against it. Of, well, it's an infinite regress. You just say, well, at this particular time, we were called time T zero. This was the state of it. And that, that predicts everything going forward. Um, so it doesn't argue against it, the fact that uh, you'd have an infinite regress. Um, In I'm just wondering wh whether it's actually the, the universe is actually just vastly more complicated and the idea of a clockwork mm. the clockwork universe <coughs> is just far too simplistic and possibly wrong i mean i, I read um a book on sort of a, a sort of idiot's guide to physics recently where even time is something that's only um sig significant at, a, at, a, at a, a big scale but if you're at the, the scale of um, atoms and um subatomic particles that actually time is nearly as simple as you think well i'm sure there are these complications but um <clears throat> the, the 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 clockwork is uh, is a uh, is maybe a slightly uh, critical it sounds term. disparaging it's not meant but, to be but there's <laughs> there's no um <clears throat> it could st still be very very complex clockwork so quite possibly it's not. So you can't say clockwork is simplistic because it can be very complex. Well, we know it's very complex. So, well, mm -hmm. I, I I disagree, Don. I think a clockwork <laughs> is mechanistic. It can be very complicated, but it can't be complex because you don't have interactions, ongoing interaction and feedback between the different elements. It's a, it's a, it's a, yes, you do. Yeah, yeah, that can be perfectly deterministic. That can be deterministic, yes, but it's not complex. It's uh, it's complicated. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to I'm struggling to think what the difference is between complex and complicated. Oh well, complex is where you've got uh, several interacting agents or elements which provide feedback to each other, which is which from which something else arises. It's slightly different. Whereas a cog in a machine, like a clockwork. It just uh, one drives the other. There's no feedback mechanism uh, from one to the other. But anyway, Colin, over to you. Okay. Um, well, my, my take on, the, if you start with the universe from a Big Bang, there has to be some minor fluctuations or variations in this huge chaotic amount of mass and energy that leads to the texture of the universe as we understand it and by some happy accident of chemistry and fluctuations and then um, self-replicating 
chemistry mm. and then evolution, we've come to be where we are today. And so if that's deterministic, that's deterministic and it's just a happy accident that we're where we are. But from a free will point of view, so another way to look at the contradiction is to say, well, how would we manage if we decided not to have free will? Supposing a group of us or me alone decided it was deterministic, there was no need to act on my free will, I'm just going to go through the world without doing that. I'm pretty sure that after a period of time, my memory would tell me it was a really bad idea and that other people have gone on <laughs> using their free will and they have made my life a misery in some way. Or, or another way of looking at the justice thing, if, they, you know, if, if we've got no free will and uh, no reason to be punished, then the fact that our society has decided that we will punish people was deterministic and we couldn't have controlled that anyway and we can't change it, so what's the point of even trying? Mm -hmm. So from a practical point of view, we need to all act as though we have free will and uh, that's the way the world works and in a thousand years' time maybe people understand it and will decide not to act on free will, but I'm not sure I want to be in that world. No, but we, we do have free will. It's just that our free will is perfectly deterministic. <laughs> 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 I don't think you've answered I don't think you've, you've thought that. Yeah. But let's look at it another way. So, so at the moment, the world is sort of building a whole load of free will machines. So they're called sort of automated transport vehicles. But in 10, 20 years time, there might be several million of machines who are making decisions, including ethical decisions. Mm. And we will have given those machines either clear instructions and will understand what they know about the world and they will be making logical decisions based on those instructions or we will have given them permission to use their own intuition to make decisions depending on what they think might be happening in the world so we are going to create a whole load of free will machines over the next few decades it'll be fascinating to see how they interact and and, and whether it we can make a free will machine that's not really that complicated it's certainly a lot simpler than our brains all, all that is possible, although uh, I think at the, we had a discussion at Bir Lisai oh, a year or more ago when we were discussing uh, robots and, and how they would, uh, could take things over. And in a way I was disappointed that people didn't fully understand how any, any decision-making machine cannot get its values from outside itself. It has to be built in. And our values are built in by a revolution and by and then based built on that by our interaction with other people but um a machine would never acquire values that came from anywhere other than its constructor okay. well, except a, 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 an automated car with a black box artificial intelligence that sees lots of its similar cars being damaged crashing and being taken out of commission might decide actually in future it will take a different action when, mm. when it's about to crash because it perceives its own you know existence is in danger and it may decide that it's going to uh, going, but, going, going to act differently but a self uh, an instinct for self preservation is a very specific value it's quite non random um and uh, unless that was built in by its makers it probably wouldn't have that for example um uh, an, alert, an automatic device is a, a guided missile. It has no instinct for self-preservation at all. But, but, but if it, it, it does what its, what its makers designed it to do. I think, I think we should, we, we, the AI, we should have a separate talk actually on... Yes, we could. It's really a subject for another night, isn't it? <laughs> I tell you, because uh, there, there are so many uh, philosophical issues with artificial intelligence that we could explore. So we'll put this up for another time, I think. Uh, um, just, can I say just one little thing about the AI thing? The reason that he's, he's, it doesn't work is the AI is the mind. And I told you, we've also got a me that gives yes. us the consciousness. Yeah, and the sure. AI hasn't got a me yet. Hmm. We've, already, we've already asked, one person has already requested for Chrissy to give a talk in the future. So we, you know, we never know, Chrissy. <laughs> you know, be prepared. Be prepared. Anyway. It's going to be, I've already been working on it for the last four weeks. It's going Very to be amazing. I see, we, very good. I, see, I see that Mr. iPad has his hand up. Yes, I, I was just going to say, I um, hate to say, um, Donna, you always have to be careful with this, that I'm, I'm completely agreeing with you that the, the claims of free will really don't go all that far, because they don't have to. 
I mean, if I say I do something mm -hmm. um, by free will, I mean, I, um, I mean, I, I did it without a gun at my head or some sort of extreme threat. But it, I'm not going any really. So, so saying that something's done by, by free will only take, take, takes you so far, but it doesn't mean at the end of the day that um, all that you weren't actually determined um, beforehand. Mm. And even if it's very, very complicated, um, free will isn't, isn't, isn't really making any strong claims. Mm. I mean, it's, I had a gun to my head, as opposed to I didn't have a gun to my head. Um, I mean, there, there are, it's a, there's a certain degree, I mean, you might do something, but you believe it's done by free will and it turns out that actually you've got a post-hypnotic suggestion that made you go and um, get a cup of tea or something like that. Um, and therefore you might say, well, that person really didn't do it by free will, even though they thought they did. But there's, there's a limit to, the, to the, clay, the strength of the claim that somebody who says they do things by free will is actually is actually claiming and the answer, answer is they're not claiming all that much yes i think that's true yeah good point okay we've yeah. actually got a question on the chat room from dom and dom is asking uh why should we extrapolate from the laws to randomness rather the other way uh, rather than the other way around from randomness to natural laws i don't think i understood that question totally I, th I think what Dom is saying, and Dom might be able to ask the question much better if he wants to uh, unmute himself, but uh, uh, I think what he's saying is you seem to suggest that the natural laws may give rise to some randomness, either fundamental or accidental. And what Dom is asking, why couldn't it be the other way around where actually randomness coalesces to create natural laws? Yes, I'm, <coughs> the thing is, I'm not really sure that there is fundamental randomness. We, we have the randomness of the balls in the tombola, but we all know that's a perfectly uh, deterministic system, uh, even though we can't analyze it. Yeah. Okay. But there, there may, it's, it's not inconceivable that there is this fundamental randomness, which maybe comes to the decaying uh, uh, radioactive elements and things, but um, uh, even they may, the randomness of their behavior may be down to our ignorance rather than the thing being non deterministic. Okay, Dom, I'm not sure whether I've did your question justice, uh, but uh, hopefully you've heard uh, Dom's answer. Right, it is quarter to nine. Are there, oh, Mike, are you got your hand up? Mike? Yeah, can I come back with just a couple of things? We, we are conflating free will and determinism in the universe in general. Even if the universe were not deterministic, that would not necessarily mean that we have free will. Um, because you could live in a random universe and still not have free will. Uh, and I think there is a real problem. And I, I, I think the problem lies within us. And I, I think, with due respect, Chris, you've misunderstood what I meant about I. Sorry. What my problem is, what is I? Is I the upfront bit, my consciousness, or is I something that lies behind that, that really makes the decisions? It seems that we always do what we want to do. And, and even if I come back to iPad's point of view, if I'm forced <laughs> at the point of a gun to do something, it's because I don't want to be shot. So actually, it doesn't actually get me any further. And it is a paradox, and it is a problem, and I think in some ways Phil's come closest to, to the point, you know, is in the end you have to say, you know, it's interesting, but you have to accept where you are, and from a pragmatic point of view, you have to actually assume you have free will, although you probably think you really don't, because there is no other way out of that paradox. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. I think this sounds like a good place to leave it. I know Jeremy wants one more bite at the cherry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, me? Yeah. Um, yeah. My question is about um, the world might appear to be deterministic. Reality may or may not be, and that might be good enough. Uh, 
the fact that we don't have any knowledge or don't have the knowledge whether it's deterministic it doesn't matter it's not really a constraint on whether we perceive the world to be deterministic but our perceptions mm. of the world whether it's deterministic or whether we perceive that people have free will or however we describe what we what we think we're perceiving that seems to be quite relevant we may appear to see the world as deterministic and that might be true the appearance and reality might be together yeah. i think that makes any yeah. sense it's it's possible that it's totally true or it's possible that it's substantially true true yeah yeah exactly of course yeah, if yeah. it's substantially it's true then true, then uh, go a century ahead and 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 the clockwork could mm -hmm. go in different directions of course we know it will actually only go in one direction but uh, again that might not be the problem is with us in the sense of how we perceive the world isn't it right from the word the start i perceive of things being deterministic i have to agree with you most of i agree that it's substantially this is the case but equally it may be i can observe someone demonstrating free will or what have you Okay, well, listen. I think we're going to draw things to a conclusion. It's been a it's been a riveting discussion <laughs> and tour de force around all the different areas. I'm going to unmute everybody so you can say thank you to Don in a second. And mm -hmm. I think yeah, the conclusion right. of all of this is that we all just do not know. And actually, we can <laughs> argue till the cows come home, but all of us, collectively or individually, we just do not know. But it didn't detract from a very, very interesting discussion. So I'm going to unmute everybody so you can now show your appreciation uh, to Dom. Okay. Thank you, Dom. Well done, Dom. That's, that was excellent. Um, before you go, uh, we, as you know, we are now living in sort of uh, pandemic times, which actually means that the philosophy program LSI has actually increased quite a bit. We're actually doing more or less weekly activity rather than just uh, monthly ones. I'm just going to you again. I think that's better, yeah. So we're actually down to a weekly uh, uh, sort of program, more or less. And therefore, please stay tuned for next week. It's going to be a lecture by yours truly on what is wisdom. You might actually enjoy that. That will that will cover similar territory in terms of mechanistic universe versus a a dynamic and fluid universe uh, as part of what wisdom is. That's uh, next Wednesday at seven thirty, and then on the fourth of August, uh, I'm going to be trying to make sense of the most fundamental question of them all, and that is what is the meaning of existence, and. Uh, I've, hopefully, some of you may have actually looked at the previous uh, parts of that. It's a five-part series. The first four were available on the BLSL website. The fifth and last one is going to be live on the web on, on uh, by Eventbrite, and you can book your tickets by going onto the uh, uh, BLSL website. And that's going to be interesting because I'm going to be doing something very hubristic. I'm going to tell you all why most of philosophy is completely wrong about the meaning of existence and why we need a completely new perspective on the meaning of existence. So that's, that's the challenge. I'm going to be shot down in flames, no doubt, but I'm looking forward to the experience. So you've got next Wednesday on uh, what is wisdom, and on the 4th of August, it's all about the meaning of existence. So I hope to see you in the next uh, week or two. And uh, stay safe, be healthy, and keep on philosophizing. And most importantly of all, stay curious. Good night, everybody.